Moses was praising God in his time beautifully. They didn't have any social media to scroll through. We're so soft these days. They were in the desert wondering if they were going to live the next day. Relying on manna and quail every day. Relying on the glory of God. They were dependent on the glory of God. We haven't even made ourselves dependent on the glory of God. We make it like it's some kind of casual thing once in a while. It's cool to see. No! We got to make ourselves dependent on the glory of God. Every day! Instead, we're dependent on the fleshly things. We're dependent on the television. We can't live without the television. We're dependent on that Instagram. We're dependent on the reels. We're dependent on all the things the world has to offer. But the Israelites didn't even have it. God ripped them out of the world. Put them in a desert where they had nothing but Him. They had no choice but to be dependent on His glory every day. And they still forgot about Him. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Repentance and forgiveness of sin should be preached in His name to all nations. Let us ask God to strangely warm our hearts and set our souls on fire. Yeah. James chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Let's stand in honor of the Lord's word. We there? We good? And the word says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Holy Spirit, you are the head pastor of this house. Please teach us your perfect wisdom. Please bring revelation, a fresh revelation to us. As our brother Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 14, please guide our minds and our hearts today. As you speak to us, please, Holy Spirit, you teach us. We're here to empty ourselves and to learn from you. May every word that comes from my mouth be of the spirit, not of the flesh. In Jesus' name, thank you so much. I appreciate you, and we all do. Amen. You can be seated. It says in James 3, we have the power to steer ships with our mouth. Well, who better than the Holy Spirit? He knows how to steer people better than anybody. And unfortunately, the enemy has studied the Lord and unfortunately he has some kind of power with his tongue too so we got to get the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to get better with our words at steering and we have to learn from him Jesus says John 16 13 the Holy Spirit will guide you to all truth he will teach you all things John 14 26 so there's nobody better than the Holy Spirit He's the number one teacher. He's above me. He's above every preacher. He's above every theologian. He's above every Bible college. He's number one. Amen? Amen. We go to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. He's number one. Amen? Amen? So many, so many, uh, so much intellectualism these days. Uh, there's this, you know, when you preach in Latin America, sometimes you'll see people in the congregation, their eyes go wide open. They're able to recognize something wise. And you can't do that unless you're in a humble state. Here we see where it says, humble yourselves. How important it is to humble ourselves. And Jesus says in Matthew 18, 4, unless you humble yourself like a child, you shall not see the kingdom of God. Why is it so important to be humble? Whosoever therefore shall humble himself. Why does it say we have to humble ourselves? Why doesn't it say God will do all the humbling for you? 
Why doesn't it say that God will cut off your hand if it causes you to sin? Why does Jesus say you have to cut it off? Why does Jesus say if you have faith, you, a wise man, builds his house on a solid foundation? Why didn't he say the Lord will build your house on a solid foundation? Why is God showing the responsibility of obedience on our end? Why doesn't he put it all on himself? And Brother James knew that well. He says, humble yourselves. He said the same thing Jesus said in Matthew 18, 4. Humble yourself as a child. Otherwise you can't see the kingdom of God. I mentioned today earlier in the prayer that Brother Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, whoever has a revelation, let him share it with the church. Brothers and sisters, do we believe that the Holy Spirit can give each of us revelations that line up with the Bible personally? Amen. Of course. The key is that line up with the Bible, right? If it lines up with the Bible, He can give you a revelation. What is a revelation? It's a deeper unlocking of the understanding of something that's of God. And it helps us. It helps us. Why does Paul speak about in 2 Corinthians about mysteries from God, from his wisdom still? So how about those fresh revelations from the Holy Spirit? And we all can have that. And these are deep understandings. But to get that way, we got to be humble, like a child. A child's ready to receive that gift. Like, you know? But really, right now, we're going to be focusing on prayer. We're going to be focusing on prayer. Getting into that secret place with God. Locking yourself in. Where he says, humble yourself before God. Draw close to God. And God will draw close to you. Does God get close to us if we don't get close to Him? No. Why not? Brother? He said it. It's what the Word says. Abide in me and abide in you. Abide in me, I'll abide in you. Yeah. See, the Lord, He resists any pridefulness that's deep in our heart. He resists any kind of prideful thinking. He resists that in us. Sometimes we can go to Him in prayer with pride. Sometimes we can go on our knees in our secret place with pride. We're not going to come out of the prayer closet feeling His presence and we're not going to come out of there seeing His glory if we are that way. The victory comes when we're seeking God in humbleness. I'm convinced, brothers and sisters, the vast majority of our problems within ourselves can be worked through one-on-one -on -one with God through prayer. But what kind of prayer? The right kind of prayer. We go to God with the right attitude. We go to God with the right mind. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> glory to the Lord. We want to see His glory. Abraham knew that. You ever notice how Abraham talked to God in Genesis 19? Or was it 18? It says that Abraham was communing with God. Communing with God. What does that mean? Gen Genesis 18. It says, Abraham, verse 33, And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. How many people in this house want to commune with God? Everybody, right? Did you know you can commune with God? Abraham's not more special than you, brothers and sisters. The same inheritance of communing with God, that same blessing, we can have that. That reminds me, next week we should do communion. 
We can have that. We can commune with God. That's a relationship. The Muslims can't say that. Can a Muslim commune with God? They can't commune with Allah. Because in their Quran, their Quran doesn't teach that you can have a deep, intimate relationship with God. That if you obey Him, you actually can become His friend. Jesus says, you're my friends if you do whatever I tell you. John 15, 14. We have the potential to be friends of God, just like Abraham was called a friend of God. That means we have the potential to be able to commune with God. Whoa. We can commune with God. He's the, that's why Jesus teach, Jesus came to reveal God as the Father. And I believe Abraham already had that revelation. You can't commune with God unless you know Him as your Father. Do you know him as your father? If not, my friends, go in that secret place and you start saying, God, I've been serving you. I've been repenting, but I don't really know that much the God whom I serve. And I want to serve you, not just to serve you. I want to serve you because I know you. But God, I don't really know you as well as I thought I knew you. But I tell you what, when you start communing with God, that's when you get to know Him. I saw one of your videos. Praise God. It was with a woman who said she lived in Egypt. And then our brother goes immediately, well, I was born in Egypt. Whoa. Whoa. She was a Muslim. <laughs> she goes up to him, she goes... Well, you know, I've been to Egypt. He goes, that's great. I was born in Egypt. Whoa! Mic drop. <laughs> you could have heard the mic drop on the street. But you know something? I saw the way she was talking to you. God is my witness. I started crying for her. I started crying for her. Guys, do you know how many people... They think they know God and they're going to hell. You know how sad that is? And I'm telling you, for the first few years when I came to the Lord, I couldn't cry for the lost. It takes a lot of time on your knees seeking God in the secret to have that heart that He has. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. God is weeping. Over these people. His heart's aching. Because I saw somebody that I love very much in that lady. And I started crying. We got to go deeper in that prayer room. We got to go deeper in communion with God. We got to go deeper. It's never enough. It's never enough to just be on a fleshly level. It's never enough to just be on a surface level. It's never enough to just stay complacent. When you really get to know God, when you really get to know His heart, when you really get to see His glory, when you really understand how much He's been there for you, how much He cares about you, how much He's answered your prayers, even the tiny prayers. You ever see a tiny prayer out of frustration? And later on in the day, he gives it to you. And you ever think to yourself, I'm sorry. I said that in a very disrespectful way and you still gave it to me. Yeah. You know how good he is, how merciful he is. I'm not saying he's going to do that every time. But he, sometimes it's like he wants to just show us how merciful he is. Sometimes he does that, I believe, to convict us, to get humble. There's many ways we can get convicted. Sharp rebukes aren't the only way. Sometimes a soft, gentle touch when we don't deserve it's another way. The Lord knows best. Sometimes He will whip us. Sometimes He will get offended. Sometimes He will get mad. Sometimes He'll be merciful when we don't deserve it. The key is, will we recognize what God's doing for us and be humble? I'm telling you guys how important it is to be humble with God. As our pastor always taught us, when you go to God in prayer, talk to Him like a nice, sweet voice. Abraham was communing with God. 
Now, as you study how Abraham was talking to God in Genesis 18, hallelujah. He says, for example, in verse 27. Uh, no, here, verse 23. Abraham, uh, Genesis chapter 19, verse 23. We just read in James, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you, right? And Abraham drew near. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It says, Abraham, King James Version, drew near. It's okay. Can you please put it up, Justice? Genesis 19, 23. I'm sorry. I feel like this is a verse we should see. I think, I believe. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. Guys, I didn't know this verse said this. I didn't study this before I came here. Praise the Lord. Do you have it? Genesis 19, uh, 18, 23. I'm sorry. Genesis 18, 23. Thank you. This is what happens. We want the Holy Spirit to teach us and lead every sermon, every service. I could sit and take notes and try to take over things. I want the Holy Spirit to take over. I didn't know this said this. Lines up with James chapter 4, what we just read. Genesis 18, 23. And Abraham drew near. See, draw close to God, he'll draw close to you. And said, will you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And then God speaks. And then he says in verse 27, look how Abraham is communicating to God. Watch this. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I've taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Do you get what Abraham's doing right now? He is talking to God with the highest level of reverence, fear, and respect. He humbled himself. He's saying, basically, um, I know I've taken it upon myself. I know I'm talking to the greatest being in the entire universe ever, the Almighty. Pardon me. Pardon me, Lord. Because I am dust and ashes, he says. Verse 27, you got it? Look how Abraham's talking to God. So he drew near to God, completely humble. Talking to God in the most reverent, respectful way. And God is talking to him like a friend. Answering him immediately. Can you imagine if Abraham was talking differently to God? Sometimes we get frustrated in the flesh. We don't want to talk nicely to God. My friends, I'm here to tell you, don't do it. It's a temptation. Because when God sees you even coming to Him with reverence, when you are fired up and, and confused and complaining and you're upset, you haven't been getting your petition or whatever the reason is, whatever it is you've been going through, you've been praying for a healing, you've been praying for something, you don't understand what's going on, you see other people getting the thing that you want, you see your circumstances and you get fed up and you get, and you get maybe you want to blame on God, maybe you want to pout on God, don't do it. Because that's the moment when you need God the most. And that's the moment you want Him to draw to you. You got to get humble and draw to Him in that way. There's a way of drawing to Him. Reverent, humble, respectful. That's when He'll commune with you. Jesus says, open the door, I knock. Whoever opens, I shall come and sup with him. Do we have the door open? Are we listening? Are we, are we really in tune with the Holy Spirit when we're prideful? Yeah, what do you want? That's a pride. No, humble. The door's always open, God. I want, I want you to come in. I want to commune with you at all times, Lord. That's how Abraham was here. And you can see God speaking back to Abraham. And Abraham said to God, 
I'm ashes and dust. Abraham didn't say, I'm a child of the Lord God Almighty. I'm your son, God. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. I'm not saying we're not children of God. <laughs> we know that we're children of God, right? When we go to God, when we go to Him in prayer, the Bible makes it clear. The key, humble, reverent, make yourself like nothing. Why? He loves that. And you can see the results that you get. God will never be angry with somebody who's coming to them humbly, reverently, like nothing. Every psalm says that he's close to a meek and contrite spirit. The Bible doesn't say he resists that type of spirit. The Bible says the latter. He resists a prideful spirit. I've had people say to me, how come you go to God like that? How come you're a, you're a child of God? I said, I'm worthy of nothing. They said, no, you are worthy. I said, no, I'm not. Because the second I start thinking like that, I can start to get prideful. <laughs> and I've seen that in brothers and sisters. It's better to keep yourself humble in your attitude and your mind like nothing. That's how Abraham did it. He called himself ashes and dust to God. And God called him friend. God didn't say, Abraham, you're worthy. Don't talk to you. Don't talk to talk about yourself like that. Abraham, don't declare that you're ashes and dust. Speak life unto yourself, Abraham. Obviously, we believe in words of, of, of declarations in this house. But again, I'm talking about talking to God. I'm not talking about talking to other people. I'll tell another believer I'm a child of God. I'll tell other people, I'll tell non-believers I'm a child of God. But when I go to God, I'm not going to tell him I'm his son. I'm going to tell him I'm nothing without him. Because the Lord loves the humbleness when we pray to him humbly like dust. And that's when he draws close to us. And that's what we got to learn. And that's when we can commune with God. That's when we commune with God and God communes with us. And you can feel his presence. Moses. We study how Moses, the man of God, the man of mighty miracles, the man with a rod that wasn't used as a walking stick, the man with a rod that was used to defeat armies of their oppressors through one smite in the water. Hallelujah. Moses, the man of miracles, yes, the man of miracles who had the rod, not as a walking stick, but as a stick that was used to beat the rock and water came and filled the whole house of Israel. How did he talk to God when he prayed? Psalms chapter 90. How did Moses pray to God? Did Moses say, God, I'm your child. I deserve X, Y, Z. I deserve to be treated like this by you because I'm your son. Instead, he says this, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations, remembering all that he's done for them. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, exalting him, glorifying him. That's how all the prayers of the men of God begin. He did, they didn't just go rattling off petition after petition after petition. They always started off giving him glory. Even the Our Father, Jesus says, it starts off giving God glory. Thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, return ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, still glorifying him. When it is past and as a watch in the night, 
Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as, uh, a, they are as a sleep in the morning. They are like grass which, which groweth up in the morning and flourisheth it and groweth up. He's glorifying God. For we are consumed by thine anger. You look how Nehemiah prayed. Nehemiah chapter 1. You look how Daniel, the man of God, Daniel. You think Daniel knew the character of God? You think Daniel knew the heart of God? Daniel, the big prophet, the anointed prophet. You study how Daniel prayed. He says, Oh, great and terrible God. Because he's terrible to the wicked. He's terrible to his enemies. They never forgot the part of the Lord that was the consuming fire. And it kept them humble. My friends, when we appreciate the Lord for who he is, when we reverence him, when we go to him in such a way, he's there, he's close. And that's the way he wants it. The true worshiper, worshipers, Jesus says, shall worship God in spirit and truth, not in the flesh. Oh, you ever pray in the flesh? How many people here pray in the morning? I do. As soon as you wake up, I think it's good to pray in the morning. Jesus did it. Mark 135 says he got up early, many, very early. So he prayed a long time in the morning early. That is the time your flesh does not want to pray. That's the time your flesh wants to sleep. So Jesus made a practice in his prayer life of disciplining his flesh early in the morning. And he prayed a long time too. Because when you deny your flesh, then you're praying in the spirit. And when you do it humbly from the heart, you're doing it in truth. And that's the way Jesus says it's got to be with the children of God. The true worshipers. So that means there could be fake worshipers. What makes a fake worshiper? What's a fake worshiper? Doing it the way they want to do it. Not doing it the way God wants it done. John 4, 24. Jesus says... The true worshipers must worship him this way. God demands we approach him a certain way. God demands when we pray to him, it's done a certain way. If anybody teaches a different way, they're teaching you to go to God differently than how he wants it. That's not right. How can we say he's worthy and then we go and say they're worthy for what they say? I don't know about you, but I want to commune with God. You ever offend somebody, they leave the table? Did you ever offend somebody and they leave the table? I believe Daniel, Nehemiah, Moses, Abraham, these men of God who heard from God so clearly, who were used by God so powerfully, who were walking with God so strongly, who were mighty with God in the spirit, in unity and communion and fellowship with God. They didn't teach a lot of the stuff we're hearing from a lot of people today. We see a pattern how they pray. Every single one of them. Reverently, humbly. Because the true worshipers must, must. Now I'm not saying you can't go to God as a child. I'm not saying when you go to your knees, you can't know that you're a child. What I'm saying is, when you humble yourself, 
You're wiping yourself before him free from pride. Because if we let even a little bit of pride creep in, we get in the flesh fast. If we get in the flesh, we separate ourselves from the spirit. You cannot walk in the spirit and the flesh at the same time, it is impossible. It's one or the other. Galatians 5.16, walk in the spirit. So we have to choose. Which one are we going to pray in? Are we going to pray in the spirit or pray in the flesh? Praying in the spirit brings results. Praying in the spirit pleases the Lord. Praying in the spirit brings you closer to God. Praying in the spirit brings him closer to you. Praying in the spirit brings the presence of God in the room. Praising God in the spirit brings the presence of God in the room. Because you are humble and you are drawing closer to him and he's drawing closer to us. And he wants to sup with us. That means his presence. He wants to commune with us. That means his presence. I'll tell you what. I believe that the Lord can visit us. How many here believe that? We're we're a house that believes that God's presence can manifest in the house of his I I believe God can, if he wanted to, he can manifest the cloud of glory just like in the old days with Moses in the temple. I still believe that. I don't want to sit here and think, no, no, that was just back then. I don't want to sit here and think, no, 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 that was just for Israel back then. He doesn't do that anymore. No, no, no. I don't want to think like that. No, 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 no. Isn't that what he's saying? Isn't that what he's saying? When Jesus says, whoever opens, when they hear me knock, I'll come and sup with them. Doesn't that mean he wants to talk to us? There's some people that say, well, God only speaks to us through the Bible. And I tell them, well, that's interesting because the Bible tells us he speaks to us in more than just that way. So if you're actually sola scriptura, if you're really sola the Bible, you're not really listening to the Bible. You're denying what the scriptura says. Because it says very clearly, he wants to talk to you in more than one way. It says in the last days, you young men shall dream, shall have visions. Your old men shall have dreams. Your daughters shall prophesy. Have the last days ended? What? So we're still in them. So that's one way he can talk to us. Another way he can talk through the word. What if he wants to talk to you through a dream? What if he wants to talk to you through a prophecy? Paul says, I wish you all would prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14. Was that just for Corinth? The sinful Corinth? The disobedient Corinth? The fleshly Corinth? The Corinth that was eating food sacrificed to idols? And Paul's still saying, I wish those guys would prophesy. The court that had fornication problems in the house. And Paul kicked out somebody from the church. And he says, I wish you all would prophesy. The court that had disorder. People speaking out of line in tongues, not during a specific time. And he still says, I wish this court would prophesy. So then with all their problems, how much more can anybody else in the house of God? Hear from God. Outside of just The paper and ink. Because the paper and ink says it. The paper and ink says he can talk outside of it too. Says he wants to sup with you. When the Holy Spirit spoke to Peter in Acts chapter 10. It wasn't written down in the Old Testament that he would have to do that and go see Cornelius. How did he talk to him? It wasn't through a prophet. It was directly to Peter. When you draw close to God, you can hear from God. God wants to say something to his children. He personally wants to guide you. He personally wants to help you. He personally wants, because if he wants you in in his will, 
You got to seek His will. He wants you to go after Him. Why? There's safety there. In order to go after God, you got to deny your flesh. There is safety denying the flesh. God's all wise. He knows what He's doing. To get in that secret place with God, there's a lot you got to do. And it's all for our benefit. I remember one day I was driving in my car and I couldn't stop praying in tongues to myself. God, it says in 1 Corinthians 14 that a man who prays in tongues is edifying himself. And I called my pastor. I said, why is this? He said, that's the Lord's presence, brother. He said, that's the Lord's presence. 1 Corinthians 12 7 says the manifestation of the Spirit through the gifts. The Lord's presence. You can have the Lord's presence in your life. But once we start walking in the flesh, when we start praying in the flesh, when we don't start, when we don't pray enough, when we ignore prayer, you get in the flesh. When you get in the flesh, I'd rather be communing with God. I'll tell you what. The tears of peace and joy you have from those few moments you've had in your time with God in the prayer closet. Remember those moments. The flesh doesn't want you to. The flesh wants you consumed with Instagram reels and TikTok and Facebook scrolling. The, the flesh wants you scrolling. The spirit wants you praying. Amen? Amen? Amen. The flesh wants you scrolling. Yeah. The spirit wants you reading. Yeah. Amen? The flesh wants you scrolling. The spirit wants you praising. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I would imagine Abraham in his secret time was praising God beautifully. I would imagine Moses was praising God in his time beautifully. They didn't have any social media to scroll through. We're so soft these days. They were in the desert wondering if they were going to live the next day. Relying on manna and quail every day. Relying on the glory of God. They were dependent on the glory of God. We haven't even made ourselves dependent on the glory of God. We make it like it's some kind of casual thing once in a while. It's cool to see. No! We got to make ourselves dependent on the glory of God. Every day! Instead, we're dependent on the fleshly things. We're dependent on the television. We can't live without the television. We're dependent on that Instagram. We're dependent on the reels. We're dependent on all the things the world has to offer. But the Israelites didn't even have it. God ripped them out of the world. Put them in a desert where they had nothing but Him. They had no choice but to be dependent on His glory every day. And they still forgot about Him. Oh, us with all our distractions. How much easier is it for us? We got to make ourselves dependent on the glory of God. We got to make our flesh down. We got to make ourselves dependent on the glory of God. We got to say, God, I'm too hungry for you. If you're not hungry for God, you got to go down on your knees in your prayer room and say, God, I want to be hungry for you, God. I want to be hungry to feel your presence, God. I want to be hungry to hear your voice. We can't be more hungry to watch those reels. We can't be more hungry for the social media. We got to be more hungry for the things of the Lord. Oh, yes, making ourselves dependent on the glory of God, not just like a once in a lifetime event. No way. Imagine seeing the glory of God every day for 40 years straight. And then you turn on him. You don't think with all the distractions, all the golden calves we have before our faces, we can't become the same way. Keep praying. 
in the spirit. Keep going in that secret closet and praying to God. Keep seeking the Holy Spirit like never before in these last days, my brothers and sisters. Keep seeking the spirit of the living God in that prayer room and say, God, I need you. God, I want to be hungry for you. God, I want to desire you like crazy. Oh, Holy Spirit, I want to see your glory manifesting. God, I want to hear your voice in such a beautiful way. God, I want to hear your voice. Please, Lord, help me. Please, Lord, speak to me, God. I'm hungry for you. I'd imagine Abraham thought it was a pleasure to beg God. I'd imagine Moses and Nehemiah and Daniel thought it was a privilege to plead with God. To be able to even talk to him. To be able to even have his holy ears accessible to our mouths. To think of him in such a way. To exalt him in your heart and mind in such a way. He loves it. He loves it. I just go into prayer and say, God, I don't want to just be that type who just says you're worthy on Sunday and then come home and really not act like you're worthy. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to help us, to guide us, to give us more wisdom. I'm telling you, you walk in the Spirit, you can face anything that enemy throws at you. You know that? Oh yeah. yeah. See a lot of churches, I, I scroll through some uh, some some sermons. I remember when first coming to the Lord, I'd visit a lot of churches and I'd hear a lot of sermons and they were like self-help sermons. Or I, I was hearing a sermon the other day, I, I listened to it for about one minute. I had to shut it off. Immediately, I wasn't getting fed. It was so carnal, it was so fleshly, it was so selfish of a sermon. And the man was talking something along the lines of, and you guys have probably heard a lot of these sermons where the preacher is trying to relate to the crowd and like relate to people that have hurt you in your past or people who are making you feel a certain way. And you're just and the, the, the sermon. The pastor is like something along the lines of, you know, when somebody does this to you, it's because they don't appreciate you. And so you don't let people like that in your life. You got to let people like that out of your life. And the crowd's clapping and the crowd's going nuts. And I'm thinking to myself, half these, more than half these people are probably just like that person. And how are they going to know unless somebody's telling them they got to repent and get closer to God and get right with God and get holy with the help of the Holy Spirit. Instead, they're being coddled in their flesh and their problems. No apostle in the New Testament talked to people like that. How are you going to grow if you keep hearing what your flesh wants to hear? How are you going to grow if you keep hearing sermons of, yup, that person did me wrong. You're right, past Preach, preacher. Yup, when people do that to me, I'm just going to let them out of my life and be free. No, no, no. That's not Christianity. That's fleshlyanity. Christianity says, I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to pray for them. When I see them, I'm going to say, God bless you. How are you? I'm not going to take it personally. I'm going to walk in the spirit and try to help them go in the faith. That's in the That's why preachers have such big churches today in America. They're preaching to appease the flesh and the people come in by the hundreds to hear it. It's fleshlyanity. It's not Christianity. But when you're really hearing stuff from the spirit, you realize I have to rise above me taking things personally. I have to be above what they did to me. Yeah, it's hard. But that's what frees you. When I hear people clapping for sermons like that, all I hear is bondage claps. Clapping to stay in bondage. Because guess what? Somebody else is going to come and offend them and they're just going to have the same problem. Taking things offensive. Taking things personal. Not delivered from that spirit of offense. Not delivered from that spirit of pride. Not delivered from that spirit of re rejection. When you walk in the flesh, the powers of hell will deceive you. The powers of hell will have authority over you. When you walk in the spirit and deny it, you have power over the enemy. You have power over the power of hell. You have authority over the spirits of darkness. Hallelujah! 
Why aren't there more pastors preaching that? Why aren't there more churches helping the people to rise up? Yes. I've been in churches where the people, I used to visit churches for months, and they just say the same thing over and over, coddling to the people's emotions and their problems for the week. Coddling. God, it's gonna, God's going to get you through. God's going to get you through your problem. God's going to get you through this. God, all those people that hurt you, God understands. All those people that hurt you and all this, and all those people that made you feel bad, don't listen to them. Don't listen. Just, just tell yourself you're a child of God. Just rise up and remember God loves you. I'm not saying all that stuff's wrong. Technically, it's true. But what if instead they were saying this? And all those people that offended you, forgive them, bless them, hug them. Don't let those words have power over you. Let the word of God have power over you. Submit your will to the will of God. Rise up, deny your flesh. If you got spirits, you need deliverance. You rebuke it in the name of Jesus. You rise instead of letting the clouds just hover over you until it's over. Rebuke the clouds. Get power. Be powerful. That's why we got so many problems in this country. Too many Christians are weak walking in the flesh. Not walking in the power and authority of the Holy Spirit. Because they're not praying. They do a two minute prayer in the church. And it's a vain prayer. I used to listen to Christian radio. I can't even stand a lot of Christian radio now. You ever hear them praying at the altar? Look at how the Moses man of God led the people in prayer. I loved how we were weeping today before God. You know why? I know God loved it. You're humbling yourself before God. And He's getting closer to you when you do that. It says again in Psalms, He's close to a meek, contrite spirit. You know, if you did that in other churches, people would think you're weird. You know, if you cried, if you cried in another church... People would think that you're a weirdo. People would feel uncomfortable. People, if they heard you, they'd think in their heads, oh, this is uncomfortable. I can't fuck. <laughs> you think that's a family? We're supposed to be a family. When you hear a brother or sister crying, you're supposed to, Bible says in Corinthians 12, when one person's suffering, we all suffer. Yeah. We're supposed to carry each other's burdens. We're supposed to love each other. We're supposed to be understanding. This is what we're supposed to be. So when you see fruit, being presented, being developed like the latter is because they're being fed flesh. Now I'm not saying we're better than anybody. We gotta help them. We gotta help our brothers and sisters, but we can't do it unless we first are right with God. We can't be hypocrites. You gotta get in your prayer room, my friends, like never before. Times are getting worse and worse. I saw um, on the news briefly, I try not to watch the news too much, just a little bit to get briefly informed because you can, you can get anxiety watching the news now. It's so, dem I'm telling you, don't watch too much of the news. You will get consumed with politics. It can really just grieve your spirit and it just takes too much time. But I like to keep up just with a little bit. It fires me up, notifies me, and we can, we can use it for God's glory. So I can help share things like this. A man... Um, who was it, Kirk Cameron? Mm -hmm. Did you guys hear about Kirk Cameron, Brother Kirk? No. He tried to do, he was basically competing with the drag story hours that are being done in libraries all over America. And he wanted to do a, a, like a Christian story. He wrote a book, a Christian He wrote a Christian book and he wanted to read it in the libraries. And I believe, don't quote me on this, I believe about 50 libraries rejected him. In California. Okay, in, Calif in California. So those 50 libraries rejected the reading of Christian books to children, but accepted half naked, I'm not going to say it, you know what, so in front of the kids, and that's okay, I just realized there's kids here, I can't say it, but that's okay, what's the world coming to? Where are the Christians? And you know what Kirk said? I like what Brother Kirk said on the news. He said, most Christians, I'm going to uh, not, don't quote me word for word. It was something along the lines of, you know, most Christians are cool just going to church saying, oh, well, this was supposed to happen. It's in the book of Revelation. And then we just kind of go home in this. And he's like, rather than standing up and fighting and lifting up our voices and taking action legally, why aren't the Christians doing it? Jesus says in John 18, 36, 
If my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight for me. Now you're fired up, brother. Praise the Lord. That's right. He says, John 18, 36. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight for me. Jesus is saying that his servants are not resisting his arrest. This was right before his crucifixion. Because he's saying, if my kingdom was of this world, they would resist my arrest. In other words, they would fight for me a physical fight. What's Jesus saying there? My servants would be fighting for me right now. Physically. But my kingdom's not physical. What does that mean? His servants are supposed to fight spiritually because his kingdom is spiritual. I've had pastors, I sat down at the table with brothers, leaders, saying we're not supposed to fight. I said, what Bible are you reading, brother? Or should we pray that your eyes lose the blindness? Because it's all over the Bible. Resist the devil, he'll flee. My servants, my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight for me. Step on the snakes and scorpions. Ephesians chapter 6, what does Paul say? Our battle is not with flesh and blood, but with principalities of this world. What do you call that? Why do we have a battle? And some people say we just pray. I said that's part of the battle. The other part, lifting up your voice. Why does it say that the righteous are bold as lions? They lift up their voice. But instead, we got a we got kitty cat Christianity over here in America. We just, yeah, it's okay, let's go home. Yeah. Uh, you like that, right, brother? And yeah, me too. <laughs> Don't ever practice kitty cat Christianity, brother. Good. He goes, he goes, never. <laughs> You're raising him up smart, brother. How old are you? Six? You got more wisdom than most adults. <laughs> Praise the Lord for his wisdom. Amen. We got to pray. We got to pray like never before. We got to pray. If, 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 if you if you got problems and things you're struggling with, pray. Pray, pray, pray. Lock yourself in that room. If you got thoughts that keep coming, distractions, put on Christian music. I know not everybody had Christian music back in the day. But you know what? Back in the day, they also didn't have all these distractions and weird things put in their mind from social media either. So sometimes we need to combat some of the things that have been put in our mind with some of the tools that we have. Amen. There's nothing wrong with playing some Christian music when you pray. It's not religious to think. Or it, I think it's religious to think otherwise. We got so much junk presented before our eyes. Sometimes we need extra tools to overcome it because our brothers for thousands of years didn't have the stuff that entered their heads. They didn't have the thoughts floating through their heads that we do. They didn't have the imagery from our past still in the back of our memory that enemy tries to rise up like we do. So we've got it harder than them, I believe, in the mind. So sometimes we need some extra help. And there's nothing wrong with playing music when you pray. Because of the cards we've been dealt with in these last days. So maybe some people are watching thinking they're, you know, no. Do what you got to do, you know, that's biblical, that's not sinful, that's not fleshly. Do it. It's a tool from God. Use it. It's a blessing. God uses people to make anointed music. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes our music is anointed. Some people mention they receive healing or they receive the spirit when listening to the songs. I say, praise God. If the music's made from the flesh, that can't happen. It's always from the spirit. We want the Holy Spirit to move any way He wants to move. We want the Holy Spirit to move. We want Him to be pleased. We want Him to be happy. Because then He carries us right with Him. I was praying this the other day. And I had this this revelation for myself. And I said, God, I look back at how much you've changed me just over the past few years. I love the man that I am now compared to them. You know, when you humble yourself before God and you let him correct you and you let him rebuke you and you let him put you through trials, when you come out of it, it's for your benefit. 
you become a better person. You'll see. You'll see. You'll become a better person. You'll become closer to the character of Christ. You'll become refined through the furnace of fiery affliction. You'll come out there like a more refined gold. It's the best for us. God wants to give us the best. Amen. But sometimes we're stubborn and we resist and we wrestle. Go pray. Go pray it out with God. Go talk it out with God. Be respectful to Him. Be humble. Humble yourself. Make yourself like nothing before God. Our 76-year-old pastor was walking with God for 50 years. Saw huge miracles. Was in a church, I believe it was Puerto Rico, and literally saw people praying for the man at the altar. And he literally opened his mouth and he saw in the man's mouth he was regrowing brand new teeth from his gums. Got into a car accident. Flew out of the windshield 200 feet. His stomach was open. He had to cover his stomach. He goes in the hospital. He's dying. He said, Jesus walked in the room. I was all alone. He touched my neck. The second he touched my neck, I felt power rushing through my whole body. Healed me. And I walked out of the hospital. His intestines came out of his stomach when he flew out of the windshield. Dying of bone cancer years later in the Dominican Republic. Dying of bone cancer. In the Dominican Republic, not every town has a hospital. It's a very poor nation. He's in his hotel room. Someone knocks on the door. He's praying for three hours because the pains came from nowhere. He described it as a thousand bites in his hip. He said he was practically paralyzed, praying to God, begging God, begging God. He wasn't complaining to God. He wasn't yapping his mouth to God. God, I don't deserve this. God, why you let this happen? Please, God, please, please heal me. Please, please. For three hours straight, someone knocks on the door. Nico, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The devil's trying to kill you right now. Open the door. Open the door. He gets up, he opens the door. Jesus is going to heal you right now. He said, I didn't even know. How'd you know? He said, the Holy Spirit told me, let's pray. He prayed for him. The pain went away. Cancer gone for 15 years. That guy. Many miracles. Way more miracles than that. That guy. His last breath. The way he prayed to God, unlike anybody we've ever heard. Right, brother? Right, brother? Have you ever heard anybody pray the way he prayed to this day? The way he talked to God was unbelievable. So special. And he always said to God what Abraham said to God. I'm dust. God, I'm dust. Mm -hmm. You go to God humbly. He's going to be this close to you. Very close to you, my friends. Draw near to God in humility. He will draw near to you. Let's pray.